All right, welcome back. Uh, podcast number 11, aren't we on? Yep. So uh, one more week, we grow one week older, I suppose. Uh, we are going to piggyback off of last week. Didn't, number 10 was about puppies. Yep, number so, 10 was puppies. So we focused a lot about puppies on number 10. We actually had a bonus. Uh, last week we did um, an extra podcast. We, we didn't really do an extra podcast. We posted an extra podcast. Ben dug up... Um, a podcast that we had done with the Release Hunting Podcast from several months back. That was kind of a uh, an extra one from last week. So uh, we're, we've got a couple of those um, planned that that just were really good interviews and and conversations that we had. And so we're working on adding those into this podcast series as well. But we're piggybacking off of number ten, which was the the focus was mainly on puppies i would say we, yeah. we talked a lot of puppy stuff and it was because i had gotten a lot of questions about puppies well i also have um this week is no different and so what i did was i picked out a couple um of the questions that we had received and a couple of them have the same same kind of theme to them and so i'm going to touch on those and then i also have another question that was specifically um requested actually from a friend of mine who knew this person um, and it's regarding uh, it's regarding in-ground fences like underground fences electric fences so uh, we're gonna talk on that that's not necessarily a puppy thing but that is a subject that we are gonna hit and I think that'll probably tie up our our allotted time or window that we're shooting for which is 30 minutes or less not that we have to but we're shooting for that so I'm gonna start right in on it um, this is an that was interesting to me I had and actually, I picked two uh, questions this week via Instagram and one, well, two of them really are Facebook. Um, but so with regards to the puppies, the reason I think this is interesting is because there is a, they, they all have their own specific, unique uh, twist on them. But I'm going to read them to you guys and let you and, and kind of point out what stands out to me. So first one here, and I'm not going to read it word for word but I'll, I will give you the Cliff's Notes version here we picked up our puppy two weeks ago she'll be 10 weeks Tuesday she's a lot like the way you described Dan the eight week old in the video so that she's referencing a puppy video that we used to have the foundation video we've refilmed that now um, and that puppy DVD is specifically on puppies but so she's referencing Dan which is a dog I trained for raised hunting uh, friend friends of ours in Iowa and they um, we, we, when we filmed that video, Dan was eight weeks old. So she says, she's a lot like the way you described Dan, the eight week old in the video. When you first got him, he wiggled and he wiggled and nipped, etc. We took your advice on holding her on her back and out in front seems to help, but she is far from calm. When we feed her, we are using the same long steady technique from the video. She does that well. And she sits, we tie her out for about two hours in the morning as we're in new Orleans and we move her into a pen indoors because of the heat. You gotta be real careful with, with putting the pups out in the temperature. So then she says, we've begun trace place training and she fights it, but we're still making progress slowly. Where we have a challenge is she still wants to bite, jump, and not hold to this, the sit to get to stay. What are we doing wrong? So I'm gonna, so that, there's one of them. Let me go to the next one. Uh, Sorry to bug you. I know you're busy and I get and get a lot of questions, but I have a 10 week old lab puppy and I was wondering what is the best time to start actually training and having them listen and give you full attention. I've been working with her on sit here, lay down and place training as well as retrieving, but she picks and chooses when she listens. Should I be, should I just be testing her like a puppy right now? I think he maybe meant treating, but should I be just be testing her like a puppy right now? I notice your dogs look a lot older. That's the second one. And the third one. Let's see. I have a seven week old golden retriever. She's picking up on the basics, sit, shake, stay, etc. Would it be bad to put the antler scent on any of her non antler training toys? I answered that and then he followed it back up with, I can appreciate that advice. My next step is just to keep working on her basic obedience and just let her chew on the soft antler and get familiar with it. So three questions this week. And the con the thing that stands out to me is they all have a little bit different twist to them. And I'll touch on each one of them. 
But what I think they all have in common and is alarming to me and I think is is something I want to make a point to everybody that's listening that has a young dog or a pup. 10 week, 10 week, 7 week. Like I have 10 week, 10 week, and 7 weeks old. All Those are the ages of these three messages. And all of them are talking about Let's see, this one says, uh, this one says, I've been working on her sit, here, lay down, and place training, as well as retrieving. This one says, seven week old pup, working on the basic commands, sit, stay, shake, etc. Obviously, some retrieving stuff, I'm assuming, because they talk about retrieving toys and retrieving dummies. And then this one, uh, at 10 weeks old, They are more, I think, along the lines of where they're probably the focus should be. They're working on some steadiness at at feeding times and that. But what they're wondering is, is they're still having a challenge, wants to bite, jump, and not hold the sit to get stay. So, like, they're looking for stay out of the 10-week-old pup. So the first thing that stands out to me out of all three of these messages is 10 weeks, 10 weeks, 7 weeks. Like, they're infants. These puppies, and first off, they're infants, and second off, they're puppies that you just took from a kennel at the longest they've been with you for three weeks. The seven-week-old one, I can't think they've had the dog more than a day or two if the dog's seven weeks old. The thing that you have to realize is you just took a puppy from a situation where it lived with its brothers and sisters for its entire life, which at, up to that point was probably about seven weeks. For four or five weeks, mom was involved, and then mom left, and then all of a sudden they've got just brothers and sisters. But you just picked them out of that pack and plopped them into your pack. I'm telling you right now, at 10 weeks old, I'm happy to have a dog that isn't having accidents in the crate. Like you watch, you watch. Now, that that doesn't mean that I don't start forming good habits early. And I think that's what these folks are trying to do. But I think all three of them. So so one, the one here that says where we have a challenge is where she still wants to bite, jump, and does not hold the sit to get to stay. What are we doing wrong? You're doing nothing wrong with the ex- exception of you have unrealistic expectations. Like, you got to have realistic expectations. When you bring these puppies home, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 weeks, like, imagine you have a kid that is literally in diapers and can't walk. Like, that's what you've got. So you can't expect them to be doing math and you can't expect them to be writing essays at that point. What you should be looking forward to is the idea of like sleeping through the night. Like maybe you try to figure out how to get uh, a routine established or scheduled. And I talk about baby stuff because if you don't know, there's another more on the way. So uh, I'm going to be dealing with this real soon. And my goal will be get the baby to sleep through the night. Like that's just an, that's just a first step thing. From there, I might work on getting the bait. I don't know what the next step would be, but it we're gonna we're gonna slowly. By the time that kid gets to be like walking around, which I don't know a year or whatever they are when they walk around. Like when they do that, then we'll work on. But but it might t- it's gonna take a year to get to that. Seven week old puppies to ten week old puppies to be working on sit, stay, recall, shake place like can you do some of that stuff yes and i think you should but it should be so minuscule it's just forming good habits you're just establishing a real early foundation and so i'm a little concerned with the idea and and what are in the question at the end what are we doing wrong you're doing nothing wrong but having unrealistic expectations so once you once you kind of change the mindset there training becomes a lot more enjoyable because if it if you don't have that mindset it will become very frustrating so that's real general. Now specific, I want to tackle the one here um, that has this issue with can't get the dog to from sit to stay. So what? Uh, at 10 weeks old, just get the dog to sit and then get the dog to sit and then get the dog to sit and get the dog to sit so much that the habit becomes really good, really flawless. I'm working on hold conditioning with several dogs right now and we're documenting it. And Ben's been watching me and we're... we're 10, 12 days into it with some dogs, four, five, six days into it with other dogs. I am, I am probably rushing it. And what I'm do, what I'm realizing, thinking about it after the fact is I probably need to do these things a few more days perfectly before I go to the next step. So this, the idea of how do I get, the, can't get the dog to hold 
sit to get to stay, just work on sit longer. Like get sit, sit, stay is sit. Stay is just a longer version of it. So just work on sit longer. And eventually after that repetition can be, happen so many times, the habit will begin to form. And you can go from two to three seconds to maybe three or four seconds. That is getting the whole the dog to hold, sit to stay. It it's hard for some of us to be okay with measuring incremental success off of seconds because we're looking to we're looking to get home runs. We don't want base hits. Base hits win games. So we need to get like one little step, one little step, one little step. So and I think that can be transferred to every skill set you're doing with your dog, whether it be trying to get dogs from sit to stay or um, you know, retrieves, like lining. You know, I, I know a lot of people that want to line dogs out real far. You can't line a dog out very far until you can line them out real close. And it starts out in your hallway. And from there, I go to my porch. And from there, I might go to the yard. And it's just, ta- it's, it's, it's rev- every time you run into an issue, no matter what it is, I think the best approach to, to assessing and figuring out a fix is by reverse engineering it and figuring out where is the hang up and then you fix that hang up. You don't, you, you, you fill holes in. There's holes there, you gotta fill them in. You don't just keep going. So um, with, with, this, with this one, I, I, my answer to them was, you have to figure, first off, you have to figure out that you have like an extremely young pup. So I said patience is probably your fix right now. Just let things unfold a bit. And that doesn't mean like let the dog do what it wants to do. It means work your plan. So so she's got that foundation DVD. If you've got our puppy DVD, you see what I do with puppies. I use puppies from, uh, I think in the video, they're probably 10, 10 weeks old, 10 to 12 weeks old, all the way up to, I think we've got a six month old in that puppy video. I show, and that six month old had very little foundation. So we... We started in the same place basically with the six month old. And I had a person call me actually this week and ask me about, they had a one year old dog and they were really you know, wondering where do they start with this one year old dog? And, and they, had the pup, they had our puppy DVD and I said, you start in the same spot as I did with the 10 week old in the DVD. Because it doesn't matter how old they are, you always start in the beginning. So whether you have a dog that's one, two, three years old or one, you know, eight, nine, 10 weeks old, you're going to start in the same spot. Physically, you might have to mix it up a little bit. You can't hold a one-year-old dog in your arms like you can a seven-week-old dog. It's just a disadvantage. But you can get the dog to sit next to you and replicate the, the steadiness and the patience with them sitting next to you instead of being in your arms. So, But what I would do is I would work on the idea of you've got this foundation. They have this DVD. They've watched it. They've referenced several parts of it. My recommendation is very simple. Continue to do that. And just talk to me in a couple months. And if you're consistent with what you're doing, I guarantee you you will see results. But if you're at if you're back at home and you're watching, you know, listening to this or in your car or wherever you are, if you're listening to this and you go, I'm gonna try that for a day. And if it doesn't work, I'll give them a call and see what I'm doing wrong. It's not enough time. It just, it has to take, you have to have, you have to practice patience. So next, I'm going to skip to the next one. The next one is a seven week old, seven. And and so we're going to pick these out specific now. Seven week old golden retriever picking up on basic commands, sit, shake, stay, etc. I don't believe that. Like, and I'm not saying this guy is lying to me, but I'm saying there's no way at seven weeks old, we're getting all this stuff. Are you taking steps in the right direction? Probably. And that's awesome. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking the dog has stuff. Like my dog's, like I said, seven weeks old. I'm just trying to get a dog to settle into the house, sleep at night, not poop in its kennel. Like pretty simple stuff. So so take a step back uh, and make sure that you are not overlooking things to speed the process up. So the question is, is would it be bad to put the antler scent on any of her non-antler training toys? First off, I, I don't, this is a toy question. I don't recommend toys. I don't recommend chews. I don't recommend things that my dog may confuse with something that I don't want them chewing on. I think chewing is a habitual thing. I think you create chewers. I don't allow chew toys with my dogs and I rarely, I'm not gonna say I never do, but I rarely have an issue with a dog chewing up anything. 
I think it's a combination of two things. I don't form chewing habits. Again, I think it's habitual. You create chewers. We create dogs that have to have things in their mouth and relieve it by chewing on them. You don't, if they don't ever see that stuff, they never have the, the drive or in, in their inherent desire to do it. I truly believe that. So it's two things. I don't create the habit early. I don't allow it to be acceptable. And the second thing is, is I don't allow my, I don't set my dog up to fail. I don't put them in a situation where they have stuff to chew. So if you let them run around the house, they'll find stuff to chew on. If you place train them, if you crate train them, if you have them in control with you at all times, they don't have the opportunity to get a hold of stuff to chew. If you're going to free range the dog through the house, and that is a that is no one's fault for things getting chewed except the person who allowed it to happen, and you're it. So the I so I'm against the idea of the the chew toys. I think he calls it non antler training toys, and I call them chew toys. And actually, a chew toy is a training toy. It's training the dog to chew. So. If he's talking about other training toys, like uh, more like a, like a bumper, canvas bumper, tennis balls, those are training those are training tools. I don't allow them to have them at all times. They stay in my training bag, and I give them to them when we're working on specific drills or skill sets. So those you could put scent on it. I don't know that it hurts. I don't know that you gain a ton. Um, I don't think it hurts. But what I what I at seven weeks old, I don't think you gain much at all. I just think seven weeks is just too early to be worrying about any of that stuff. Um, so, and that was kind of how I answered it. I said seven seven weeks. I don't think it hurts, but seven weeks is really young. I I would not worry much about what he's talking about uh, teaching the dog to sit, shake, stay, etc. I wouldn't be worried about that so much as I would more foundational stuff. And at seven weeks old, it's routine, crate training, tying out uh, probably in a couple weeks. I think. Seven, eight, nine weeks is a little early. Um, about 10 weeks is usually when I start tying them out. That's going to teach them to give the pressure to the neck. And then from there, I can start heel work. Uh, so then at the end, he said, I can appreciate that advice. My next step is to just working on her basic obedience and just let her chew on the soft antler and get familiar with it. So he's right with the idea of his next step is basic obedience. That's what we talked about. The idea of letting her chew on the soft antler, that's definitely not what I recommend. And, and I think people got to understand, and I overlook it because I, I just assume people realize and know it, that the reason that that training dummy is soft is not to allow dogs to chew on. Um, I don't want them chewing on anything. The idea behind it being soft is so when they run up to it, they don't poke themselves, jab themselves, have some type of a negative introduction to the shape of an antler. I want it to be positive. And so when they get excited about a retrieve, which is what they're probably going to be, I want them to run up to it and not have some type of a negative connection. I don't want them hurting themselves. I want them to understand that that shape, I'm conditioning them to understand that the shape of the antler is a really good thing. It's very positive. It gets me a retrieve. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Eventually, I'll add scent to it. It doesn't have to have scent now. But we're just forming an early, early habit that is very foundational in a shed dog with the idea of conditioning the shape of the antler to equal retrieve retrieve is the reward so i wouldn't uh recommend the idea where he ends it with let her chew on the soft antler no different than any other chew toy i certainly don't want them i don't want them chewing on anything and one reason i don't want them chewing on a soft antler is because you chew on a soft antler what are we training like that's training when i go shed hunting i don't look for dogs to go find sheds and chew on them in the woods i look for them to pick them up and bring them back to me so we're just trying to form that habit now the last one uh, 10 week old lab puppy wondering what's the best time to actually start training them and listen to give you full attention boy I, i've got some that are 10 months old that i can't get full attention out of so this goes back to the idea of patience uh, some of us have dogs that are 10 years and maybe can't get full attention out of them just depends on the dog but again they've been working on sit here lay down and place training as well as retrieving too much stuff in my opinion i think you i think instead of covering everything very thin which at best is what you're doing at 10 weeks old, I'd cover one thing really well and master it. And then I'd add another layer to that. And then I'd add another. So I'd, I'd start in the beginning, the very, very basic foundation stuff. And then I start adding layers of training on top of it. Instead of tackling 10 things at once and doing none very well, do one and practice it and perfect it. It's the same situation I'm in with hold conditioning right now. I've got dogs that I really want their feet to move. I really want to keep moving this process along. I want them to walk around with a bumper in their mouth. 
And I have some that are getting there and I have some that are not. And I'm, I either have to realize if I start moving dog's feet before they're ready, I'm going to have problems. Or I say, just take an extra couple days, make sure it's perfect, and then make sure it's perfect again, and then start in on adding a new layer to this process. Don't go 10 things at once and don't do any of them well. Do one thing at a time, do it perfectly, and then add a link to that chain. One chain doesn't do us a lot. When you put lots of links together, you've got something you can use. So, But you can't get a half a link and then get another half a link and then get another half a link and expect that chain to work. It just won't. So those are these puppy questions. Now, this last one I'm going to talk about is not necessarily puppy, but we are going to cover it and change gears with it. It's regarding this electric fence. So question, I'm going to read the question for you guys. So, And I, I kind of got prepped on it because my buddy texted me about it. My buddy knows uh, the gal that sent this to us. Um, says, uh, my question is related to the in-ground electric dog fences. First of all, are you okay with these in general? I live in town and I'm thinking about putting one in for our lab. Second, assuming you're okay with electric dog fences, at what point do you suggest we start training process or introduction to the electric fence? Any suggestions or feedback would be awesome. Here's my thoughts on, on it. So in general, if you've listened to anything I talk about, if you've seen anything I talk about, I am dead set against shock collars. I don't use them. I think they create more problems than they fix. I think the, the, the problem comes in those who hold the button. We as a society are not patient enough to use them responsibly. I include myself in that. I just don't, it's that. And I also go, I just don't think that that's the philosophy that I'm going to get the most out of my dogs. And as a trainer, my objective is to get the most out of my dogs. I don't think fear tactics are the way to do it. I like dogs that want to make me happy and tap into their natural bit ability. So I don't, I'm against shock collars. I don't use them. I don't use them. I don't encourage the idea of it. I think the reason a lot of people use them is because they don't know how to do it without. And everyone says you have to have them. That's my rant there. Moving on to this electric fence. So here's my thought on this. And what I, the reason I don't think they, I, I think that you can use them successfully. My parents had one. My parents had one with dogs. My dog, my parents' dogs were not like real trained. They were family dogs, and um, they were all right. I mean, they had a, a decent foundation to them, but they they just weren't what what I do with dogs. But they had an electric fence because their dogs would run away. Their dogs would run out of the yard and they'd run away, and they they just they didn't have the foundation strong enough. They didn't have the control to not have those dogs run off. If that dog wanted to run off, they could not call it back. So my first fix is always, in my mind, I think you just have to have a really good foundation. I think that foundation eliminates the need for stuff like that. But I also understand and respect the idea that if you're living in town, if you've got a road, it's it's an insurance plan that if that is what it takes to ensure that your dog does not run off, does not get hit by a car, does not get in trouble that way, I'm not against it. What I reason I am not against it is because I think if it's working properly, and I think there's, uh, I don't know a lot about electric fences, so I'm not going to talk a lot about the use of them because I don't use them and I don't know much about them. Just like I won't talk, I, I, I'll explain why I don't use a collar, but I'll explain why I can do it without a collar more so than the collar itself because I just don't use them. I don't know much about them. But the fence part, It takes, if you get a good one, and I'm sure there are good ones, and I'm sure there's some that are like you get what you pay for. And the key is if it works, it takes away the human element. And the human element is what creates the issue with a shock collar, a large part of it. So if you take away that human element, what I mean by that is if the thing is working and the dog goes over it, it it activates or, you know, it it reacts, it shocks or it gives stimulation or whatever you want to call it. And it's a negative. So it's, it's correcting this idea of you can't go to this spot. Now, I know there's a process that goes along with it. There's flags, there's visual markers, there's introducing it, I think, before the power's even on to it. Like, that would be what I would do if I wasn't going to use a collar. I would do the same thing. I'd use physical things. I, I have that with dogs. I have trained dogs to not go on carpet at my house. They do not go on the carpet. Like we don't have very many rooms that are carpet. The few that we do, the dogs do not go in. 
the difference between hard floor and, and that carpet is a clear visual border and it physically feels different. And so what I do is with consistency and repetition, as the dog approaches and steps over that line and no, and it's firm and it's a firm correction. And if I put the dog on a lead, I can get a physical correction too. I can give them a little pop on the neck, just like I would if they get stepped out of the heel zone. So I can get a dog, the second it, it's about timing though. And the second it makes that step and I make a correction to it, they're going to learn very quickly. If I don't step over there, he does not correct me. And in fact, I might even praise you. If you get close to it and you don't go and you come back, I say good. So it's time. It's just like place training. Place training is the same concept. It's a physical border perimeter that teaches a dog that's your spot. You're safe there. You can stay there. You can move anywhere you want on it. You just can't go off of it. This electric fence or doing a yard is a big place training. It's a giant place training, but it's a lot lot more variables there's a lot more distractions it's bigger it's it's just there's a lot going on there so if you follow the process that i and i'm sure they spell it out with these training with these fences but physically i think you have to have this visual thing for them and have them have an understanding there's i think some type of a correction prior to putting a collar on a dog and in burying a line i think it's just not fair to the dog to surprise them that way they have no idea it's coming so but the thing about it is, the reason I say it's okay if you follow the, the process is by taking and eliminating the human element of it, your timing can't be bad. So like the timing is very important, correction and praise. Like if you have, you can, you can time, you can have correction and praise and if you don't do it at the right time, it doesn't work. You can have, you can know how to do it. You can know what to say. You can know all the mechanics, except your timing sucks. Dog won't learn. Just timing is really important. So the timing, if you've got a collar and you've got a, a wire that is buried in your yard and it works, the batteries are good and things plugged in and it's consistent and all that stuff. Every time you move that collar within so much, such a distance of it, it should start to stimulate. You go over it, it's going to increase the stimulation. So as long as that works, and that's the computer end of it or the technology end of it, not us on the other end with a button. It's not, we have nothing to do, you have nothing to do with the timing of that. It's all pre-made based on technology. As long as that works, I think the timing is probably gonna be very good and it'll allow your dog to learn. So, but I, I do think you have to follow that process. I would recommend, so she, she asked for any suggestions or feedback. Well, the, I don't have any suggestions as to how to train the dog for it. If you decided, if you said to me, I don't want to use an electric fence, but I want to have my dog stay in my yard, um, how can I do that? I'd say figure out a way to create a physical boundary that is visual and then work the dog to that boundary. And as they approach it, give them a warning. And when they get to it, correct. Ah, 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 no. So it's, it's, a, it's a scaled version of me teaching the dog to not go on the carpet. It's a scale, that's a scaled version of me teaching a dog to not come off their place. So it's incremental. It's just a bigger, bigger version of place training is what it is. So, but I, I, I'm not going to go into real great detail on this is how I would go about training with this system because I just don't know enough about the system. I think there's probably some uh, variation between co uh, electric fence or collar, you know, um, in-ground fencing. I, so I would really recommend making sure you work with whoever it is you're getting it from. Uh, get as much information as you can there. And, you know, that would be something that I would, if I were you, I'd invest in that time and effort and dollars to make sure I got the right system. Um, but I like, I like the idea of it as opposed to trying to do it with a sh traditional shock collar by all means because your timing probably isn't very good. Just like 99.99% of the people out there, timing isn't very good. I think it's one of the biggest things that people struggle with. Uh, and this is this kind of relates to mechanics. But if you have, if there are issues, I've got another video that I was gonna gonna show, uh, and I may do it yet. There's a guy that had sent it to me, and he was had a puppy in a kennel, and the puppy was whining, and 
really bad whining and wanted to get out and it stopped for about three seconds and his question was should I praise that puppy at that point and the answer was absolutely not because it's just not long enough time and you're just going to get the dog to whine again and so he sent me a video of it and I saw it and the reason his his potential problems were there was because of timing he would have timed things poorly that is one of the biggest issues people have when it comes to working with dogs they just have bad timing you get timing when you get good feel and you get good feel from lots and lots of repetition lots of lots of practice i can get if you give me any job i can say with confidence if i practice it long enough i'll get i'll get better at it i might not ever get great at it but i will get better i will improve there's one common thing with all of that. It's the more you do things, the better you get. Now, you do have to study it. You do have to figure out what the timing means. But pr- practicing it, executing, that's where you get good. So uh, we hit 30 minutes on the head. I'm under 31. Pretty proud of that. I hope that answers a couple of the questions that we've gotten here this last week. Uh, podcast number 11, man. She's in the books. Again, thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate you listening. Um, we've got we've gotten into a bit of a habit ourselves here, a little bit better routine, making forcing ourselves to be a little bit uncomfortable and just say, you know what, we're going to schedule these things and we're we're doing it. And so it has made all the difference in our ability to stay consistent with getting these recorded and getting these out to you. I love doing them. I'm getting a lot of feedback, and I thank you for that. Please continue to listen to them, share them, subscribe to our channels. What would they be? Subscribe to our channels. YouTube is another good one that we're really making a push on. So if you're if you're uh, um, visual, we're also going to look at some of these podcasts. We're going to start video blogging them. Isn't that what we're going to call it? Video podcast. So we're going to make a video podcast of these. I know some people maybe maybe don't do the listen to thing. So we're going to show it to them as well. I have a fancy iphone recording it right now so we're pretty high pretty high on there but uh we'll be showing those soon so it's probably all going to end up migrating to our youtube channel that's at dog bone hunter and then all of our social media is that too thank you again um we'll be back with you guys for another episode here coming up soon so take care